want to read these eight verses again, beginning at verse 1 of Romans chapter 12, as we continue to look at our reasonable service. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. For I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, and according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion or the analogy, literally, of faith, or ministry, let us wait on our ministering, or he that teacheth, on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, and he that ruleth with diligence, he that showeth mercy with cheerfulness. <clears throat> Salvation, we know, flows from God flows from his eternal purpose. It's made effectual by his grace and by his spirit. These things we know here in this church, these are common truths to us. They're not strange at all. We believe these things. And yet we also know that man is held responsible and is duty bound to receive this gospel. The gospel comes with the force of a command. You remember in chapter 10 how the apostle, quoting Isaiah, by the way, said uh, they have not all obeyed the gospel. They have not all believed our report. They have not all obeyed the gospel. The gospel comes with the force of a command, and therefore we are to obey it. Yet, as we saw this morning, Paul spoke of this gospel as that which he had received. And, of course, this speaks of grace. It's a gift that we must receive. But yet, uh, concerning our responsibility, we are duty-bound to believe this gospel and to receive it. But we can only do that by the grace of God. And it is God who puts it in our hearts to will and to do of his good pleasure. It is God who enables us to believe and to receive the gospel. So he not only offers the gift of his fullness we receive and grace for grace. He gives the gift and gives us grace to receive it. But I say again, it's our duty to do so. Duties come with the hearing of the gospel. And duties come with the receiving of the gospel, that is for sure, and that is what we are considering here is those duties of grace. Duties of grace, things that we are to do because of the grace of God that we have received, these things that are only, it's only reasonable that we should do. And think about that for a moment. He says to prevent, present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, and that is your reasonable service. You know, we've all known and heard of those who, even on, in, at a human level, they have had their lives saved by some individual. Someone stepped in and put themselves in danger and literally saved their life. And they feel like that they're obligated to give that person their life and sometimes even become an annoyance to the person that saved their life because they feel so indebted. 
And doesn't it strike you as strange that some, so many, profess to have received life from God, to receive his amazing grace, to receive, have received all these benefits, and at Christ's expense, their, their wrath was taken by Christ. And yet they feel no obligation, almost feel like they're doing him a favor to, to receive it doing God a favor just to receive his gospel and get this ticket to heaven, this fire escape from hell, and think that there's nothing, no, nothing that binds them, no duties that they should be uh, concerned with because they have received of the grace of God. From this passage, we can plainly see that the practical tendency of the doctrines of the gospel is to enforce the duties of grace. Verses 1 and 2 gives us the great motive for this and also the, the power by which we do it and the goal that we have. What is the motive for this? He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now you can't even begin to, uh, to evaluate that. You can't begin to measure the mercies of God in this matter of salvation, in what we have received in the gospel. And he says, by the mercies of God, I beseech you. So there's your motive. Where are you gonna get the power to do it? Well, he says that we are not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Now, I'm repeating myself, I know, but this is regeneration. The mind is renewed when we become new people, new, new men. When we're regenerated, we actually partake of the nature of God, according to 2 Peter chapter 4. The divine nature is put into us with new inclinations, with new desires. We're not new as far as our physical being is concerned. All the hardware is there, but we're made new inside. The heart is renewed. The mind is renewed. And so we are, this is only done by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is the one who regenerates. He's the one that makes the word of God effectual. So there's the power, the motive, the mercies of God, the power, the spirit of God, and the standard, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Pretty high standard. Why would you aim at anything less? But that is what we are to prove. That is our duty as Christians, that is our duty to grace that we prove in our lives what is that good and that perfect and that acceptable will of God. That is the mark that every one of us is to be pressing for in this race, in this sprint or this marathon, whatever you want to call it, of, of salvation. That is the goal that we are to have before us. In Hebrews chapter 12, he talks about the author and the finisher of our faith being the one that is set before us, and he is the standard. He's the goal, and we're engaged in this race, this marathon, and that's the goal. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 3 says that he's pressing toward the mark, and there you see he is, it's an analogy that has to do again with sports. I know that the Apostle Paul, I'm quite sure, was aware of the Olympians and he was, I'm sure that he knew about these things. I'm not saying that he went to the arena every chance he got, but I believe he was up to speed on those things. You couldn't have had that kind of knowledge of Olympic wrestling and, and sprinting and marathons and uh, winning the ro loyal wreath and all of these things if you didn't keep up with those things, know what was going on about you. And he often used these analogies. But in, 
In Philippians 3, it's a sprint. He's pressing toward the mark. He's leaning forward. He's giving it all he has. And what is the mark he's pressing for? The high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He said, I haven't attained it. Not as though I'd attained it. But I press for it that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ. That's what I'm apprehended for, to press toward that mark, and that's what I'm doing with every fiber of my being. He's saying, I'm going to win this race. I'm going to win that crown. And he's pressing toward it. He, and that's what we're to do. We, we are to set our goals very high, even on perfection. You say, well, you can't be perfect. Yeah, we are convinced that we can't, and we convince ourselves of that all the time. Every time we do commit something, we know that it's perfect. No, we can't be, but we can try to be. We can press for it. Paul was pressing for it, and now he has attained it. He's in glory. And one day, we will be able to attain that too. But I, I am sure that it, it is that for, for those who are pressing for it, they are the ones that are going to attain it by the grace of God. There is a duty to grace, and we are to, we're to strive, motivated by the mercies of God, all that God has done for us. What can we do in return? And it begins with this complete surrender. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. It has to do with body and soul. Maybe I should reverse that and say soul and body. A lot of people are, all they're concerned about is the soul. They just want to get that soul saved. They don't care about the body, whether that follows through or not, whether they yield their members as members of righteousness or just leave them as members of unrighteousness. That's not a problem for them as long as that soul is saved. I know I'm going to heaven when I die. That's really not the attitude of a born-again person, is it? I'll get saved now and then perhaps I'll consecrate my members later. I'll go part way now and later I'll surrender my things to the Lord. These gifts that God has given me, I'm going to use them for me now. Maybe one day I'll surrender them to the Lord. My money, I, uh, I want that for me. Maybe someday I'll sur surrender that to the Lord. But for right now I've got my soul surrendered and, and I'm going to heaven. But this is not the attitude of one in whom the Spirit of God is working, renewing the mind, renewing the heart, weaning us away from the things of the world and this transformation that is taking place. This is real, and this is what the child of God, this is what we are to take seriously. Yes, grace is free. We receive it freely. You can't buy it. But I believe that it should be in the heart of every recipient of grace to do everything in his power to show his appreciation for it, to do what he can to serve his God, motivated by the mercies that he has received and continues to receive every day. But any faith that leaves you conformed to the world is not saving faith. That is just true. A faith that does not initiate a complete transformation, that's a false faith. We just need to call it what it is. This is the will of God concerning you even your sanctification. Does the Bible say that? That's the will of God. That's what God wills. He didn't save us just to keep us out of hell. 
I'm glad that he's going to keep us out of hell. I'm glad that he saved us. He's going to take us to heaven. But he saved us to make us holy. That is the goal, to restore us to the place from which we fell in Adam. We put off the old man. That's corrupt. Put it off. Renewed in the spirit of our mind. We put on the new man. And what, how is it described? Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. That is the new creation. It's created anew after righteousness and true holiness. So that from which Adam fell and we fell in him, that's what we're restored to by grace. That's God's goal. And I know that we have more in Christ than we ever lost in Adam. That is a, certainly true and we rejoice in it. The fact that we have standing in Christ that we never had in Adam, that we're planted on that rock, as Donnie prayed a while ago, and we're not going to fall. We have one that is seeing to our salvation unto him who is able to keep you from falling. He can do that, and he will do that. But he keeps us in the way of holiness. I'm also convinced of that. This commitment involves total transformation of the character. And this is a commandment. Be ye transformed. That's an imperative. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your minds. This is changing how we think. This is receiving a new disposition, new inclinations, receiving a new mindset whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises, whereby we, we have attained unto God's nature. We have that within us. We have been, we've received this. And I'm not saying we're gods now. No, but we have a nature like his, inclined to holiness. Renewed man is not a new substance. All of the hardware is there from creation. It is a transformation of the character. That's what we're talking about. A transformation of the character. Changing how we think. And changing how we think changes who we are. And again, not in substance, but in spirit. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And when we are regenerated by the Spirit of God, we think differently. There just can't be any other way. Either that or it's not really regeneration. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things literally are becoming new. Who you are determines how you think about sin. It really does. You see this in Paul's own testimony. He knew that there were two natures there. He knew he wasn't eradicated of that old nature. It was still there. But you see in Romans chapter 7 that Paul now does not identify himself with the old man. He identifies himself with the new man. He said, there is another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. He had that renewed mind. He had that new nature now, but there was still an old nature. And he, he with his renewed mind, he was warring against that nature. So I'll say it again. Who you are determines how you think about sin. The Apostle Paul there is 
not confessing that he's a wicked sinner. He's, he's confessing that every day of his life he's battling against that old nature so that he does not allow his body to come under it. He keeps, I keep under my body, he said, lest after I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. No, it was an everyday battle, and it's the same battle that you and I are engaged in if we are truly the Lord's. Thus your life will prove what is good and what is acceptable. Change must be continual. This is an ongoing thing. We are constantly being renewed. And we know that, sadly, we have backsets every now and then. We have times when we fail. And it seems like we've gotten a 15-yard penalty in our pursuit of the goal line. But we take that to the Lord, we confess it, we call out to Him for grace to overcome these things and to continue to press toward that mark. Because as we noted before, the tenor of the way of the child of God is toward heaven, it's toward holiness. Though sometimes he may not look like it. But that's the tenor of his way. But there is constantly more dying to sin to be done and more living unto righteousness to be done. And this takes place by divine transformation. So we, we've seen that uh, the duties of grace begin with complete surrender. And this, the duties of grace involve total transformation. Transformation of the character. I want us to see next that this commitment requires an honest accounting of oneself in a larger function, in a larger relationship to the body of Christ. That involves our relationship to ourselves, certainly. Our relationship to God, but our relationship to the body of Christ. This commitment requires an honest assessment, an honest accounting of ourself, myself, yourself, in the larger function of the body of Christ. Where do we fit into that? What are our duties? And from verses 3 through 8, that's what he's talking about. And on past that, that's just what we read tonight. And here again, this has much to do with our thinking, with our thinking about ourselves. You notice what he has to say? For I say through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Thinking, thinking, thinking. How do we think? How is our mind involved in this? We have to think of ourselves first scripturally. As we think of our relationship to the body of Christ, our function in it, what we are to do as members of a body. We're not just independent anymore. It's not just me. It is my brethren. We are a family and we are united in Christ. We are one and we're to be united. We're to be of one mind. We're to think the same things. And that's not to say that we're all cookie cutter and we're all just exactly alike. And we couldn't possibly be if we understand anything of what we've read because we have different functions in the body. But our goal is the same. Our mindset is the same. And it's not about me. It's not about self-aggrandizement. It's about serving the body. 
and performing my duties to Christ in the body. He's the head of it. But we think of ourselves scripturally, what is my role, what is my place? According to my gender, some things I am ruled out from as far as offices and ministry in the body of Christ because of gender. What are my gifts? God has gifted everyone severally as he wills, we learn in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And there, I don't believe there's a member of the body of Christ that doesn't have gifts. We have gifts. Well, I just don't have any gifts. Yes, you do. If you're a Christian, you do. He's gifted everyone severally as he wills. And he didn't give you your gift or me my gift or gifts. They may be plural. I've known people who have many, many gifts, very gifted people. But they're all to be used to the glory of God, to serve Christ, our head, to function as he directs us. He is the head of the body, but for the good of the whole body. We are to think as to our maturity in the Lord. Yes, there are novices in the church. They have not been saved very long in some cases, and therefore they're not to be thrust into some role of preaching or being a deacon or, or whatever it might be. They're a novice. They're, they're to be learning. They have gifts. They have gifts to serve the body with. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that it's always struck me in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where he's talking about, he says, you covet earnestly the best gifts. Or he says, covet earnestly the best gifts. And that has always seemed like a strange thing for the apostle to say. To use that word covet to start with and to tell the church, now covet earnestly the best gifts. Now that can be the imperative mood or it can be the indicative mood. And I for one believe that it's indicative. He's saying to a church that is abusing gifts and abusing many things, and many are seeking to, to uh, exalt themselves, and he's actually pointing out something. You are seeking what you think are the best gifts. But I show you a better way. Love. If I had... If I could speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and if I don't have love, I'm a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal, he says. But he mentions in the list of gifts the gift of helps. And I have known people that had the gift of helps, and there are some here to, right now tonight. You have the gift of helps. It just seems like that you can't see anybody doing anything that you don't want to help them. And that is so admirable. And talk about a valuable gift in the church. And some do not have it. Some don't have the gift of helps. But some do. Some just seem to know what to do to be of help. No right where to get a hold of something, just what to do to be the biggest help. But there are all kinds of gifts that God gives, and some are listed here in this, uh, this reading that we did. And not to get ahead of myself, but I personally believe there are two categories of gifts here that he's talking about. When he says there, he speaks of whether prophecy, let him prophesy according to the proportion or the analogy or the boundaries of faith, so it's not one's individual faith, like the charismatics will take this, and, and they will say, oh yeah, I've got great faith, and here's the things I'm doing with it. I'm prophesying, and I'm receiving these words of prophecy, and I'm, I'm just being such a blessing to the, 
to the kingdom because I have great faith. But that's not talking about personal faith. It's talking about the faith. It's talking about the proportion of faith or the analogy of faith. It's talking about the boundaries of faith. Whatever you do, keep it within the boundaries of faith. The faith. And don't get outside of them. And don't be doing those things that the scripture forbids because that's to get outside the boundaries of faith. And don't do those things that seem like you're adding to the scripture. That's to get outside the boundaries of the faith. But there are gifts that have to do with prophesying. And I believe that when he goes on to talk about other functions of the gift of prophecy, he's talking about those that are in charge of the preaching of the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God, and they are to exercise their gifts of prophesying, not so much in the sense of receiving a message from heaven and conveying it to the people, but preaching the message that we have. New Testament prophesying, I believe, if not 100% of the time, 99% of the time, is talking about preaching. You know, we take what the Old Testament prophets have prophesied, and with the New Testament, we can preach their prophecies better than they could. You say, well, that's kind of arrogant. No. They didn't always understand when and in what time frame their prophecies were going to be fulfilled. They searched and tried to figure it out. Well, we know. We know what, what the time frame was concerning a lot of their prophecies. So we can expound their prophecies better than they could. But it's not because we have the gift of prophecy that we can foretell the future. No. It's because we have the Word of God and we can preach it. We can teach the Word of God. And we can expound their prophecies and enlarge them with the New Testament commentary on them. I, I can just imagine those prophets of old, great men that they were, such choice men, so many of them, getting together and when do you think this is going to happen? Is this going to happen in our lifetime? You know, when they were trying to figure out when it was that Christ was going to come and when he was going to suffer, they understood he's coming, he's going to suffer. When is it going to be? Is he coming in our lifetime? Well, Peter goes on to say, no, not in your lifetime. These are in our lifetime and on whom the ends of the world have come and, and have the gospel in its fullness. We understand this. They did not. But I don't say that because uh, to give us something to be puffed up about. No, that's something to be humble about. That the Spirit of God has enabled us to understand these things. But when he speaks of prophecy and when he speaks of ministry, there in verses 6 and 7, those are nouns. Prophecy, ministry, and then these subordinates that come under them are verbal nouns. These are things we do. These are things that people do under those categories. Now, you may disagree with that, but that's the way I understand this. And I don't necessarily think that he's talking about the supernatural gifts of the Spirit here. I believe he's talking more about the ordinary gifts of the Spirit that the, the church body has to function. And I think it also coincides with what we find in Ephesians chapter 4, where he says Christ is sent up on high, leading captivity captive, giving gifts to men. He's sending gifts, and he gives the gifts of the ministry. He gives pastors, and he gives evangelists, and he gives prophets. He gives pastors and teachers, which most believe, as I do, that he's saying pastor-teacher. Pastors that teach, teaching pastors, and they are equipping the saints for ministry. So here's ministry that comes in, just like it does here. There is prophecy and there's ministry. And it is the job of the preachers, those that teach and preach the Word of God. They have these offices. Some are offices of ordination. 
But those that handle the Word of God and teach and preach, they are to be busy instructing the body and leading the body in ministry. I can't remember exactly how that's worded, so I'm going to turn over there. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Before I got up here, I knew how that was worded. <laughs> you ever have that problem? Now he says here that Christ has ascended up on high, leading captivity captive in verse 8. Now that he ascended, what is it that he descended? First into the lower part of the earth. He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, or some pastor teachers, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry. Now, there's a comma after saints. So our translators felt like that these are two things. For the perfecting of the saints, this is what these, these offices of, of the preachers, whatever, uh, whatever they're called, the evangelists or the prophets or the pastor teachers, their job is to perfect the saints. And their job is for the work of the ministry. But if you take the comma out, and in the Greek there aren't any punctuation that's supplied, and it's indicated by the structure of the sentence how to supply for the English, but a lot of people think that there should be no comma there. That the, the work of the ministers is to perfect the saints for the work of the ministry. And that makes sense. And that's so, it coincides with what we see in Romans chapter 12, where the, those that have the responsibility of handling the word of God, they're also those, and that doesn't say that they're not ministers too. As a matter of fact, our Lord Jesus Christ was the greatest preacher and apostle and prophet of, that ever lived. And he was also the greatest servant. And he said, I came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. So the ministers of the gospel, though they're instructing others in ministry, they too are ministering, not just in their handling of the word of God, but in their ministering to the saints and whatever the needs are. And of course, this ministry here, the minister, this takes in the office of deacon because a deacon is a servant, he's a minister. And he takes care of the ministration of the church. Very important work. The office of deacon is a very important office. It was instituted, as you know, in Acts chapter 6 to give the apostles and the prophets, and those that handle the word of God, more time for the word of God and prayer, and they would not have to serve tables. That's not, not to minimize the importance of seeing to it that the funds are distributed properly and that everyone is taken care of as they should be and that whatever all the bills are paid on time and whatever the missionaries get their checks, all of those things are very, very important, as well as the daily ministration of the church. And there are those that have those offices, an ordained office, office of ordination, for those very important matters. But then there's general ministry. And I don't believe you have to be ordained to an office to be a part of the ministry of the church. And those that have the ordained offices are to minister to those, to others, to prepare them for ministry. Is this making any sense? I believe that that's what, is, what he is teaching us here in Romans chapter 12. But these are... These are important things. This is our function in the body. So how are we to conduct ourselves? Humbly. That's what he says. Very humbly. Philippians chapter 2, he says, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, 
Fulfill ye my joy, that you may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man on the things of others. You see what he's talking about here? This is our reasonable service. This is, this is what grace produces. First of all, it teaches us how we are to be related to the church. One thing you might consider, should I join myself to the church? Well, if you're not a believer, no. If you've not been saved, no. But if you are a believer, then yes, you should join yourself to a local assembly. Now we're talking here, and this, what Paul is talking about here is not technically the local assembly. Though that which he says can be only be properly exercised through the local assembly. I hope that makes sense because that is true. Let me show you what I'm talking about in, in chapter 12. He said, for we, being many, are one body in Christ. And everyone members one of another. Do you notice he includes himself here? If he's just exhorting the local church at Rome, then that's a misstatement. Paul was not only not a member of the church at Rome, he had never been to Rome. He wants to go there, and he's going to go there, but he's never been there. He's not a member of that church, and yet he says, so we, being many, are one body. What body is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the larger body of Christ. He's talking about the universal church. I know some, that's like a curse word. Some would contend that there is no such thing as the universal church, all local. Well, I would agree that probably 95 or more, maybe 97% of the times that the word church or ecclesia is used in the New Testament is speaking of a local church. But there's some places where it cannot be speaking of a local church, and that here's one of them. Another place is in Matthew chapter 16, where he says, I, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So there have been a lot of local churches that the gates of hell have prevailed against that have gone apostate and fallen apart. But the body of Christ, those that are in Christ, who is the exalted head of the church, the scripture says he is the head of the body of the, of the church, he is the beginning, the firstborn of every creature. He is the head of the church. That's in Philippians, I believe. But in Ephesians, you have the same thing. No, that's in Colossians. In, in Ephesians, you have the same thing, the exalted head of the church. The universal church, the body of Christ, which every believer of all time is a member of that body. And I believe that includes the Old Testament saints as well as the New Testament saints and as well as all saints. If it doesn't, then I don't know what the Old Testament saints are going to do for a Redeemer because Jesus said he gave his life for the church and he wasn't talking about a local church or like local churches. He was talking about the universal body, which includes saints if Adam was a believer, all the way from Adam to the last one that's been brought into, into saving union with Christ. But we need to consider these things one must honestly evaluate his life as a member of the church. And as I said already, we're talking about in the strict context here, he's, this is obviously the universal church, including all the body of Christ. 
But our gifts are exercised in the local context, in the local assembly. Kind of hard for us to tithe to the universal church. Kind of hard for us to, to minister uh, in, a, in an everyday way to a universal church. Some ways we can, but we minister to those about us, our church family. And Christ is also, without any doubt, he is the head of this local assembly. We are under shepherds, those who are pastors, elders, we're under shepherds. Christ is the shepherd. He is the head of this church. He's the head of every true local New Testament church, but he is the exalted head of the church universal. How are we to conduct ourselves? Well, we're to be modest in our thoughts about our gifts. He makes that very clear. He says we're to be sober. This sobriety, this moderation must also include our opinions, our views. Some people have great knowledge, but they're so abrasive with it. And they're so um, almost domineering. And a, a, a weaker brother or someone that doesn't have quite their knowledge, they have a way of just really lording it over them. Well, a person with that kind of knowledge needs grace to go with it. And one thing about one thing about these gifts, many people have gifts that do not have the grace. They have gifts, and with these we see right here having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. If you have a gift, it's grace. It's been given to you. Why should we? take a gift that's been given to us and what do we have that we didn't receive? Can anybody tell me? We don't have anything we didn't receive. So how can we become puffed up over something that wasn't even ours? It was given to us and we were given grace to use it. But we need the gifts of grace. We certainly need them, but we need grace to use them and to be gracious in our use of them. Well, I've let my time get away and didn't get finished, but we will take up with this study at a later time and pursue this further. This is important to me. This is, and not just to me, I trust it is to you as well. These are important matters. This is a part of our reasonable service. To be a part of a local church, these gifts are exercised in the local setting, for the most part, to be a part of a local church and to minister there and to be useful there of one mind, one accord with those that we worship with, loving one another as family. Donnie was teaching tonight how that Esther's decree was granted and her seeking for a decree was on the basis of love. She loved her people, and therefore she sought to get Haman's decree reversed. That it couldn't be carried out. His was all out of hatred. He was filled with hate. That was a man under the curse of God is what it was. He was an Agagite. He was a descendant of that King Agag that, that old Saul let go. And he had the curse of God on him. Donnie pointed out tonight he was a type of Satan, and he really was. But Esther, she sought this out of love for her people. She wasn't wanting to destroy anybody. She wanted her people saved. And we are to minister to one another and seek God and serve the brethren out of love in the grace that is given to us 
within the boundaries of the faith. That is how we serve the Lord in serving one another. Every service is unto the Lord. Whoever the recipient may be of our service, whoever may benefit, it's all unto the Lord. He considers it that way, and he's delighted to have it that way. You give a cup of cold water to a disciple in his name, he, uh, he accepts that. That's done to him. In, the, in that you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me, he said. These kind things. But let's serve one another in the bonds of love according to the grace that has been given to us, let us serve one another. And in doing so, serve the Lord. And one thing that needs to be stressed, and we'll get to that, is the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. No place in the local church for rows and wrangling. There's just no place. In the bonds of peace. Peace.